Go ahead and turn in your Bibles tonight uh, to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 is where we're going to be, and we're going to look at verses 9 uh, to 11. As I shared this morning, if you were here, the, 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 uh, the title of tonight's message is Praying for More. And, I, and that's a kind of a curious title, especially in that time that we live in. And I warned you, uh, or asked you not to panic this morning when I shared that. Uh, I have not suddenly become uh, one of those prosperity preachers, uh, not by a long shot. Uh, the more uh, that I have in mind in this sermon or in this title is related to our growth as disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what I uh, had in mind. You see, the Apostle Paul uh, had this same desire for all the churches that he planted uh, along in his missionary journeys and that he kept in contact with and, and, and would revisit over the years. And yes, this growth comes through the studying of God's Word and, and applying God's Word. We know this, but it also comes as we pray for one another. We pray for these things to, to come about. You know, every one of Paul's letters include prayers. They open with prayers, powerful prayers, for growth and discipleship. And uh, we have evidence of that here. I'll share just a few of them with you. From a uh, first one from Ephesians, Ephesians 1, verses 15 to 19. It says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. And in Colossians 1, verses 9 and 10, it says this, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And then the last one I would share is First uh, Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. It says, we give thanks to God always for you, all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. And you see, his letter tonight to the Philippians is no different. It begins the same way. And after following a, a gracious greeting and a word of thankfulness for their partnership with him in the ministry, uh, Paul offered a brief but pointed prayer for the church there in Philippi. And even though his prayer is only three sentences long, it clearly reveals God's purposes or uh, uh, Paul's purposes uh, and his, his desire for his friends there in the church of Philippi, that Philippi was dear to him. They were very dear to him that he was thankful for the work that they had accomplished. Paul wanted even more for them. He desired greater things for them and for the Lord to bless them and use them in even greater ways. You see, it's right and good for us when we come together and pray. We come together on Wednesday nights and we have our prayer service and our time of prayer and, and, we, and we pray for uh, the, the healing and, 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 and surgeries and, and, it's, and it's right and good to do those things. To pray for those that are sick and those that are afflicted. It's right for us to pray for those that are having surgery. It's right for us to, uh, to, to pray for those that are going to be uh, traveling or, or whatever the case may be. But listen, that's not enough. That's not enough. That, that, that's just the very tip of the, 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 the need for our prayers. There's so much more for us to pray about. So maybe we should not focus so much on just praying more, but focus more on praying for more. Does that make sense? To pray for more. To, to, to pray for more, to be fervent in our prayers, but be fervent for more of what makes us more like Jesus. That's what Paul is doing here, and that's what I hope to, for us to do as well. You see, we can learn uh, to pray for more tonight as we look to Paul as our example, as he prays that the church of Philippi would be more loving and more discerning and more fruitful. So go ahead and grab your Bibles, if you have them with you, and stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word together this evening. 
just three verses. Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Father, we thank you for this passage tonight. God, we thank you for the privilege of prayer, that we can even come before the King of Kings with our petitions is miraculous in itself. And God, forgive us where we fail to do so as often as we should. Forgive us for when we come to you with a shallowness and pettiness. Help us to pray more deeply and seek in the things that are above. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to, to pray for our brothers and sisters to, to be heal, healed and to, to be well and to be safe and all these things we often pray for, God. But help us to add on and go deeper in our prayers, that we would pray to, as Paul does here tonight, to pray that we are more loving, that we are more discerning, and that we're more fruitful in your ministry, God. We love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. And so some people will get kind of overwhelmed with prayer, and say, I'm not really sure what prayer is, but you know, in the simplest terms, uh, prayer is this talking to God. That's really all it is. It's talking to God. It's having a, a, an exchange with our Heavenly Father. And we can always be assured that He is listening intently to every word that we say. He is always longing to hear from us, that we have His full and undivided attention. And uh, as I was preparing this week, I, uh, I was reminded of a scene from uh, the movie Bruce Almighty. Has anybody in here seen that? A lot of y'all have seen that. And basically the gist of it is, is that, that, that the character Bruce, uh, Jim Car- uh, Carey, uh, was kind of, you know, kind of mocking God and making, you know, making light of who he is and how easy it was and this and that and the other. And then basically God, who was played by Morgan Freeman, uh, let him be God for a while. So you think it's so easy? So here, I'll, I'll let you be God. And one of the scenes that stuck out in my mind was where, uh, you know, that Jim Carey, uh, had to answer prayers, and he, and he got on his computer, and all the prayers were coming up like emails, and his screen just kept on filling up just over and over again. It says, like, you know, the inbox was like, you know, millions and millions of, like, prayer requests, and of course, you know, you know being, you know, divine in the movie, he, he started just, you know, go, typing real fast and replying to all of them, reading them all, and this and that and the other, and he, and he got done, he took a break for a second, he looked, and just, he didn't make a dent. They just kept on coming. He wasn't making a dent, it just kept on coming and coming, and finally, he just uh, clicked yes to all, you know, and was done. And, of course, that sent the world into chaos. And everybody had their, their prayers answered. He didn't even read them. He just said yes. And so uh, everybody's winning the lottery and everybody's, you know, doing this, that, and the other. So it just went into chaos. But it got me thinking about uh, that, that God is not like that, right? He, he's not just too busy to hear our prayers. He's not too uh, uh, you know, preoccupied that he wants to hear us. And he hears us individually. And he addresses us individually. You know, it's, it's, it's that time of, uh, of prayer is, is special uh, for us to be able to spend with our Father. See, we're not ever going to overwhelm God with our prayers, and we will not shock Him by what we pray for either. <laughs> we won't shock Him. He wants to hear it all. He wants to hear from us. So let's take a look at what Paul uh, was praying for and, and commit to making it our prayer also. Uh, the first thing that we see in our text tonight is that Paul is, is telling us or or, in, or through the Ephesians, to, that, uh, to pray that we will become more loving. More loving. Verse 9. It says, And this I pray that you, your love may abound still more and more uh, in knowledge and all discernment. And so what Paul's saying here, it's right there in the verse, our love needs to abound more and more. Our love needs to, to, to grow. That Paul first uh, uh, mentions a concern for their love. He knew that a love was essential, essential for them to be the individuals in the church they needed to be. You see, if their love was lacking, the church would suffer. The church would suffer, and the mission of the gospel would suffer also. You see, we will not share the gospel with people that we do not love, right? We will not. If we don't care for people, if we don't love people, we will certainly not go to them and share the gospel. Someone once wrote, there is nothing that makes us love a man so much as prayer for him. You see, I, I prayed before 
uh, when I got called to come here, and, and I knew that I'd be coming here, and then the, as the church voted me in, uh, I began to pray uh, hard and heavy that God would give me a love for this church, that God would give me a love for this church and a love for this community. And guess what? I'm still doing it. I'm still doing it. I'm still asking God to give me a love for the people of this church and a love for this community. And so uh, the reality is none of us are capable of loving as we should apart from God producing that type of love in us. Right? We're just not capable of doing that. But, but God desires for us to be loving. That we all know that prayer changes things. But when it comes to love, prayer changes our hearts towards others. That we'll grow to love them if we ask God to help us. If we ask God to help us to love. You see, if you're having a difficult time with someone, and it's unlikely that you're going to pray for them. Uh, you may find yourself praying against them or something like that, which is a whole other issue, and that's wrong in itself. But it's doubtful that you will pray a prayer over them that God would bless them. But if you start to pray for them, I guarantee you that your attitude will change. Your attitude will change for them, that prayer must grow for the love of God to grow in us and in others. You see, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we don't get to pick and choose who we will love. We don't get to do that. We don't get to do that. We don't get to say, I'm going to love this person, I'm not going to love that person. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd rather go here than I'd rather go there. I don't want to be around those people. I just want to go to these people. I'll share the gospel here, but I won't share there, right? We don't have that option. We're not allowed that freedom to, to, to do that. You see, Jesus made that clear when, when, when he was uh, correcting some of the wrong teachings on, of the Jewish uh, leaders of that day uh, when he was given his famous uh, Sermon on the Mount in, uh, in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 uh, to 47, it says this. It says, You have heard, it, heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. You see, I, this, this passage is kind of dear to me. I, I did a, a, a sermon a years ago from this passage. It's probably one of my, my very first sermons, I guess, you could uh, looking back on it that way. And, uh, and I called it my whoop de doo sermon. Because basically what he's saying here, if you love those who love you, whoop de doo If you greet those who greet you, whoop de doo what's the big deal, right? That, that everybody does that. That's, that. The point is that our love will be different. You see, if we only love those who love us back, what's distinctively Christian about that? Nothing. Nothing is distinctively Christian about that. Everyone does that. And that was Jesus' point. That we're to strive to love all people regardless uh, of whether they love us back or not. And then Jesus even goes so far as to tell us to love our enemies. That's counter, isn't it? That's difficult for us to do. To, 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 to love those that use us, those that it will even persecute us. We're to love them also. That Jesus isn't calling us to do something that he hasn't done for himself. It's not so crazy to him, you see, that he's already done this. He already did this on a global scale. That's what the cross is all about. That we were all his enemies because of our sin, and yet he still chose to love us enough to die on the cross for us. And even as the Roman soldiers were crucifying him, he loved them and asked his Father in heaven to forgive them even as they, we were wielding that hammer in those nails. So how else can we give selflessly of our time, our money, and our resources to people that we don't even know? How is that possible? The love of Christ. The love of Christ that, that God makes us able to love this way. That Christ's love in us and for us compels us to love others in this way. But it's not always easy. And Paul knew this, and that's why we must continue to pray that we will be more loving towards all people, that our love would abound more and more, as he says here in this first verse. So I would ask you this. Do you know what it really uh, makes a church attractive to visitors? 
You know, when you have visitors, and every once in a while we're fortunate enough to have some visitors come here. You know what really stands out to visitors when they come to your church? You know what makes them want to come back again? It's not good music. You know, music's wonderful. It's nice to have good music. And, it, and it's awesome to have good preaching. That's important. And it's not just having good programs for their children, right? It's not that. You know what, what really catches their attention? Love. Love. They can tell a church when they walk through those doors whether a church has love or not. You can feel it. And you can see it in the membership. You can, you, can, you can cut it with a knife. They feel loved and they feel welcome when they come through those doors. And they can see God's people have a genuine love for one another also. And that's what Jesus said in John 13, 35 that makes us distinctive. He says, by this all, that all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You see, we need to pray for our love to grow for one another. And we need to pray that our love will grow for all people. Amen? That's what Paul is saying here. Right? To, to, to praying for our love to grow is an aspect of prayer that we often overlook. We often pray about many other things but not love. And so let us be sure to commit to pray that we will become more loving. And the second thing that Paul shows us in our verses tonight is that we need to pray that we will become more discerning. More discerning. Verses 9 and 10 it says, in this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. And I found this uh, illustration that, that, that uh, shows this lack of discernment quite well or the need for discernment. It says, a young man was walking through a supermarket to pick up a few things when he noticed an old lady following, following him around the store. Thinking nothing of it, he ignored her and continued on. And finally, he went to the checkout line, uh, but she got in front of him. And, uh, and pardon me, she, she said, I'm sorry if my staring at you has made you feel uncomfortable. It's just that you look like my son, who, di who just died recently. I'm very sorry, replied the young man. Is, is there anything I can do for you? Uh, yes, she said. Uh, As I'm leaving, can you say goodbye, mother? It would make me feel so much better. And he said, sure. And as the old woman was leaving, he called out, Goodbye, Mother. And as he stepped up to the checkout counter, he saw that his total was $127.50. How can that be, he asked. I only purchased a few things. Your mother said that you would pay for her, said the clerk. <laughs> right? <laughs> he wasn't very discerning. He wasn't very discerning uh, in that situation. Listen, we need to be discerning in life. We need to be discerning in life, not just to avoid scams and being taken advantage of by con artists, uh, though that is important. I think Paul's primary concern for the Philippians is that they be discerning in what is truth and what is error in regards to biblical matters, spiritual things. You see, Philippi was not exempt from the false teachings that plagued many of the churches there in the first century. And the main opponent that uh, with, with, with Paul was dealing with from town to town, from church to church, was known as the Judaizers. The Judaizers, uh, uh, they would teach a, 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 a faith plus work salvation. They would teach that you must become a Jew and then uh, keep all the laws and, and the, the rituals of, of Judaism. If you were a man, you needed to be circumcised. Uh, all these things that a Jew would do plus faith in Jesus. Right? And that's a huge thing. You see, they made a very compelling argument. You see, most false teachers are. They're very convincing. They're very knowledgeable. They know how to mix just enough truth with their error. And that's why we need to be praying for discernment, for more discernment. You see, faith in Jesus plus anything is not the gospel. Faith plus Jesus uh, in anything is not the gospel. It leaves you condemned uh, all the while, you think that you're being reconciled back to God. That Paul had, had preached the one true gospel. The very same gospel that Jesus and the other apostles had taught. That forgiveness of sins and eternal life only come through repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ. Period. Nothing else. No works. No offerings. No burning candles. Uh, no working at homeless shelters. No help little old ladies cross the road. None of those things. Repentance and faith, period. Now, do we do good works? 
Do we work at the homeless shelter? Is, do, do we do charitable things? Are we good people? Do we strive to do good things? Absolutely. That's works of our salvation. That's after you're saved. That's not to earn your salvation. That's a huge, huge difference. And so this was the gospel that Paul was preaching. Paul called these Judaizers dogs, evil workers, and the mutilation in Philippians chapter 3. In the book of Galatians, he cursed the false teachers to hell for their damage they were causing. Listen to what he wrote in Galatians 1, 6 through 9. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. That's an anathema. The same thing as I've said, he wishes that they would condemn themselves. In verse 9, as we have said before, so now I say again, if, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what we have preached, let him be accursed. You see, people will die and spend eternity in hell by believing the wrong things. By believing the wrong things simply because they did not have discernment. We must have discernment in our churches. You see, good and faithful Christian men and women will be robbed of joy and suffer loss that they did not need to suffer simply because they lacked discernment. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Be sober, be vigilant, be discerning is what Peter is saying. The same line of thought here. The devil is a trickster. He's a clever deceiver. He's a liar. He's a murderer. He's a destroyer of men's souls. That he's out to get you and me. And we know that he can't take our souls. Our salvation is secure. But you know what? He can certainly make our lives miserable if we let him. If we let him, he can make us miserable. If we're not discerning, that we must be alert to his scheming ways. And one way to be alert is to, by knowing what the word of God says. Knowing what the Word of God says in another way is by staying constantly uh, uh, in prayer and asking God for more discernment as we pray. We can, we can look to Jesus as our example here. As He uh, was prayed up and His uh, head and heart was full of the Word of God when Satan came to tempt Him. In the same way, we see each time that Satan made an offer to Jesus, guess what His reply was? The Word of God. The Word of God. So his, He was our example in being, being discerning. So how do you discern what is right and wrong in your life? Right? What is the, what is the de- deciding factor? How you decide what's okay, what's not okay? And I would just say this. For a Christian, there is only one right answer. And that's the Word of God. That's the Word of God and, and, and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Joseph Stowell Uh, who served as the president of Moody Bible once who wrote this about discernment. He says, Discernment in Scripture is the skill that enables us to differentiate. It is the ability to see issues clearly. We desperately need to cultivate this spiritual skill that will enable us to know right from wrong. We must be prepared to distinguish light from darkness, truth from error, best from better, righteousness from unrighteousness, purity from defilement, and principles from from pragmatics and i agree i think that's a great explanation so let us commit to pray that we will be more discerning and thirdly and lastly let us pray that we will be more fruitful more fruitful verse 11 says being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by jesus christ the glory and praise of god you see we can pray to be more fruitful every single day of the week and twice on Sunday. We can do that. And yet nothing will change unless we're willing to put in the work. Unless we're willing to put in the work to commit ourselves to the spiritual disciplines that are necessary for fruitfulness to happen. To commit ourselves to prayerfulness. To commit ourselves to to reading, to studying, to, to meditating on the Word of God, to actively witnessing to the lost and serving in our spiritual gifts listen to me god expects us to work god expects his children to grow and to be fruitful our fruitfulness brings him glory and praise that's what paul says right here in this verse 
Being complacent and unproductive is very displeasing to the Lord. Good enough is never good enough when the Lord has empowered you for so much more. Let me say that one more time. Good enough is never good enough when the Lord has empowered you for so much more. Don't compare yourself to someone else. You will be accountable for you. And that's it. Don't let someone else rob you of that blessing. You see, we see the Lord's displeasure towards the unproductive uh, uh, individuals in the parable of the talents in Matthew's gospel. All right, Matthew 25. Matthew 25, verses 14 to 29. Listen to this. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, uh, to each, uh, to, to another one, to each according to his own ability. His own ability, that's key, own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who received the five talents went and traded with them, And made another five talents. And likewise he who had received two gained two more also. But he who uh, had received one uh, went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time the Lord of those uh, servants came and settled the accounts with them. And so he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents. Saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been joyful, been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. Uh, and at my coming, I would have received back my own, mine own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from me and, and give it uh, to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he, he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. God expects for us to be fruitful. He expects for us to be productive, to do something with what he has given us. You see, faithfulness will produce fruitfulness. Faithfulness will produce fruitfulness. That we all want to be used by God to our fullest potential, don't we? I'm sure nobody sets out to to be mediocre in their faith and their walk with the Lord. That we all want to finish our time here on earth totally wrung out for the Lord and the advancement of His gospel. That we all want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant from our Lord when we see Him face in face, don't we? We need to ask Him to help us to be more fruitful. You see, Paul makes sure to note that it is by Jesus Christ that this fruitfulness is possible, that we can only bear fruit because of the righteousness of Christ in us. And so really the bottom line for this last point is when we are faithful to do what the Lord calls us to do and go where he tells us to go, he will be faithful to produce the fruit in our lives. He will be faithful to produce it. So let me ask you this. Are we honestly giving God our best efforts? Honestly, are we giving God our best efforts? Or is there room for even greater faithfulness? I think we all know the answer to that. There's definitely room for improvement. So let us commit to pray that we'll be more fruitful. And so closing this evening, you see Paul's prayer to the church at Philippi serves as a challenge. Right? It's not just giving us some tips to have some better things or be more varied in our prayers. It's a, it's a challenge for all of us. Not only should we be willing to pray for our church and one another, but we should be uh, using our prayer time uh, to be honest and to examine ourselves in our own lives. Are these three things that Paul desired for the church in Philippi evident in our lives? Is it evident in your life? Are you as loving as you should be? 
Right? Are you as loving as you should be? Are you as discerning as you should be? Are you as fruitful as you should be? And if you're like me, it's an easy no. The answer is no. Absolutely not. I have so much room to improve in these areas. You see, if not, if you're like me, your life is lacking. You're not measuring up at this point. You need to join me in praying for more. Ask Him to make you more loving. Ask Him to make you more discerning. Ask Him to make you more fruitful. And listen, it's not for your praise and your glory. It's for His praise and His glory. Amen? Amen. And listen, if you're here tonight and you're a guest and you've been coming for quite some time and you're not yet saved, listen, you don't need to concern yourself with these things. All this this discernment and being loving and being fruitful, that's not for you. You see, my prayer is that the Lord will convict you of your need to draw you to Himself and save you by His grace. You see, if He's dealing with you tonight, if you feel Him tugging at your heart, you feel that heavy hand of the Lord upon you, I urge you to respond in repentance and faith unto salvation. And then guess what? All these things we talked about. Then He will fill you with His Spirit and will begin making you more loving, more discerning, and more fruitful just like the rest of us. Amen? All right. Let's pray and we'll have a time of response. Lord, once again, we just want to say thank you for this day that you've given us. Uh, the, the blessing and the, the privilege of, of being able to spend uh, hours upon hours with your people, with your church, under your word, praying, praying together, uh, studying the word of God. And so, Lord, now as we uh, leave this place, God, help us to be the church out there. Help us to be your witness in this community. Father, help us to, to love all people. And, Father, we know that the, the greatest measure of our love to anyone would be willing to share the gospel. So, God, help us to be bold witnesses for you in this community. God, help us to, as we've asked tonight, as we've studied this letter, help us to be more loving. Help us to be more discerning. Help us to be, Father, all the things that you'd have us to be. God, help us to be fruitful. Help us to, to ring ourselves out for the gospel. Help us to, 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 to spend our days doing all the things you've called us to do. Help us to not be distracted in the things of this world. Help us to, to look forward to that day where you would say to each one of us, good and well done, my faithful servant. God, for those here tonight who have not yet trusted your, your son Christ as Lord and Savior, God, I pray that you would do business with them also. That tonight would be the night where everything changes. Lord, that their prayer would be, forgive me of my sins and be the Lord of my life. God, do a work in us that only you can do. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.